Um, we have three distinguished panelists, uh, Kimmer Lamote, Mackenzie Wark, and Paul Lierberman, who are going to be discussing Kierkegaard as media critic. Uh, and Kimmer, would you like to get started? began with faith. He assumed faith was immediate, given, immediately given, something into which we're born, even born with, and then spend the rest of our life developing the rational capacity to understand. But for Kierkegaard, faith was not where we begin. Faith was a result. Faith was an expression, an expression of movement. For Kierkegaard, movement is the medium in which faith occurs. And if you want to understand faith, movement is that with which you must begin. But not any movement. For Kierkegaard, the movement that faith is, is particular, precise, passionate, repeated. And it has a signature. It looks like, if you can see it, a leap. It's a leap best exemplified, perhaps, by Abraham. Abraham, who loved God, Abraham, who loved his son Isaac. And in a moment when those loves seemed to contradict one another, when God seemed to ask Abraham to sacrifice his son, Abraham, in that moment, was able to find ways to move, ways to think, to feel, to act, that stayed true to his loves. For Kierkegaard, that's what faith, that's what faith gave Abraham, the ability to stay true to his loves to hold that paradox together in passion. Now, most commentators of Kierkegaard interpret this leap of Abraham's with an up-down motion. Abraham went up to infinite resignation and down to the finite. He went up to God, up in his belief in God, the movement of infinite resignation. God is, God is love, God is all, God is truth, God is that, I, that whose will I must obey. Then the movement down was movement down to the finite, to Abraham, to the love for the finite. Loving Isaac, I'm sorry. Abraham had faith, and he was able to get Isaac back. So I want to suggest that once we begin with movement, and we think about this leap again, there's more that we can learn about faith. Kierkegaard was inspired in linking faith with a leap by Lessing. But Kierkegaard went further. So good is Abraham at leaping, he said, that he is like a ballet dancer. Let me read you one little passage from Fear and Trembling here. It is supposed to be the most difficult feat for a ballet dancer to leap into a specific posture in such a way that he never once strains for the posture, but in the very leap assumes the posture. Perhaps there is no ballet dancer who can do it, but this knight, that is Abraham, the knight of faith, does it. In describing faith, in Abraham in particular, in terms of the leap of a ballet dancer, Kierkegaard would have had inspiration. In the 1830s and 40s, when, during the 40s in particular, during the time that he was writing, the Royal Danish Ballet was going through, was re itself reaching new heights. Under the artistic leadership of Auguste Bournonville, the Danish Ballet became known for its fast footwork, for its weightlessness, the weightlessness of its dancers, for the amazing leaps that would land and begin and land and take off. A dancer would scarcely land before launching off again. 
And in ballet, the basic leap is called a grand jeté, jeté, to throw from the French, a big throne, right? To leap is to throw, it's to throw oneself. It's to be thrown by oneself, and in being thrown by oneself, to become the one who made the leap, the dancer. So how is it then that a dancer learns to make a leap that gives an impression of weightlessness? How is it that a dancer learns to take off and land without falling? A movement up, as any dancer knows, requires a movement down, right? A dancer bends her knees, presses off the floor. The farther down she goes, the farther up she can rise. Likewise, a clean landing is not a matter of just coming down. If you just come down, you fall onto the ground, right? A clean landing, coming down, is a matter of finding the up in the down, finding the lift that enables you to push off the floor once more. So a dancer is one who finds the down in the up and the up in the down, stretching the range of the possible, exercising this generative tension between gravity and ground to open up a space, a space that exists only in that movement, a space of potential to move. It is a space that comes alive in the moment when a dancer moves. So to this leap isn't just up, down. <coughs> A leap looks like an outward expression, but it requires that you go deeply in as well. It's equally a movement inward. Learning to leap is not a mechanical matter. It's not just a matter of a body is not a machine. You don't just learn to put your body in certain kinds of positions. Learning to leap is a matter of cultivating, awakening a sensory awareness, a sensory awareness of the potentials of a bodily self to move. It's a matter of inviting sensation into awareness. When our senses are not just given, we educate them, we awaken them, we stir them to life. So the more deeply a dancer is able to open into an inward space and awaken the sensory awareness, the more he has to mobilize and release himself in space. Up, down, out, in. There's another generative tension that a dancer exploits, and that's forward and back. A grand jeté moves en avance, it goes forward. But in order to move forward, a dancer must gather herself backward as well, so as not to leave any moment of herself behind. I keep thinking of Harry Potter and apparating as the characters try to move from one place to the other and they can't splinch themselves, right? If they splinch themselves, they leave a piece of themselves behind. Right? A dancer has to gather backward to be able to move forward. Again, exploiting the generative tensions of gravity and ground to open up a space of possibility. According to the American modern, modern <coughs> dancer, Martha Graham, it takes 10 years to make a dancer, at least. It takes thousands of leaps to make one perfect arc. And what is it that a dancer has when a dancer can make that leap? According to Martha Graham, it's not mastery, it's not control, it's not even the ability to make the leap per se, but it's innocence, spontaneity. It's an intensification of bodily perception an intensification of bodily perception that allows that dancer to be present in the moment of flight, to be present in that moment of flight, and in that moment of flight, suspended between the up and, down, up and the down, to find the moments, the movements that she needs in order to be able to land without falling. So this intensification of bodily perception, I just want to sort of repeat this, opens up a space for receiving impulses to move that honor and align with those, the generative tensions that the dancer has been practicing. A dance, the dancing makes a dancer into an open, receptive site of generative crisscrossing tensions, a site into which movement streams and from which it explodes, a place from which she can become one who throws herself, who has thrown and continue to throw herself. All right, so this is how we talk, can talk this is what talk about a leap gives us. So how is it that faith is a leap? What can we learn about faith from a leap? Well, first of all, we realize that faith is not what gets us into a leap. Faith is not something we have before we leap. So it's not like we can quell our anxieties, for example, in the kind of choices we've been talking about, and come to a point where we feel confident, and then we'll leap. Faith is not a thought, it's not a belief, it's not an idea. Faith, uh, the leap, is what faith is. It's an action, and it's an action that makes the individual 
what the individual is. The individual isn't an individual before leaping. Abraham wasn't the father of faith before leaping. Abraham becomes the father of faith because he leaps. Moreover, this action of leaping is a bodily action. To have faith, to be able to make the movement of finitude, to be able to find the down and the up and the up and the down, means being in touch, literally, with one's own desires. Abraham knew he loved Isaac. It means being able to know those desires, feel those desires, and honor those desires. It involves learning to love the finite, to love bodily shell selves of all shapes and sizes, to love the earth in us and around us. The implication here is one that I don't think you're quite, <coughs> quite fathomed. You can't embrace the finite if you don't have a sensory capacity to feel it, to engage it, and to engage that finite not as a matter of instinct or as a, or as a demand, but as a potential for knowing more love. You have to be able to embrace the finite as that which has the possibility to reveal the movement of the infinite. Abraham had this ability with every step he was able to receive impulses to move that expressed his love for both the finite and the infinite. He was able to choose love over reality. I don't think we'll fully understand the significance of Kierkegaard's leaping faith, however, until we ask about who it is who's describing this leap of faith. That person, in fear and trembling, is Johann de Silencio who calls himself a poet. Johann de Silencio is one who reads and writes. He reads philosophy, he reads Hegel. He understands Hegel's system more or less, or so he says. But he cannot understand Abraham. Reading and writing, Johann has made the movement of infinite resignation. He admits it, he loves <coughs> God, he loves truth. Yet in loving God, in reading and writing as he does, he is gripped with anxiety in the face of Abraham. It's because he reads and writes, because he's made the movement of infinite resignation, that he is gripped with anxiety. His anxiety compels him to write and write and write some more about the impossibility of doing what Abraham did in constantly finding the movements to make that would express his love for God and for Abraham, for Isaac at once. So why then, the question is, you know, for us readers, why can't Johann leap? Why does he spend the whole text talking about why he can't make these movements? Why doesn't he just make them, right? And he spends, you know, Johann spends the last part of the book giving excuses, giving reasons, which we could see as excuses for why he can't leave, and I won't go into those now. But I think in the text, Kierkegaard is enacting something else. Johann cannot find the movements to make within himself. They don't appear. The movements of faith don't appear because the practices of reading and writing in which he is so deeply, devotedly engaged are not cultivating in him the inwardness, the receptivity he needs in order to find the up and the down, the wisdom in his bodily desires, and the land. He is stuck in midair, describing the impossibility. My sense is that over the course of his writing years, Kierkegaard understood this predicament more and more clearly as his own. He wrote because he loved God. He wrote to love God. He wrote to obey what he thought God wanted of him. And yet the more he wrote, the more he understood the movements of faith, the more he realized that his reading and writing were not helping him make them. <coughs> the closer he got to faith, the farther he realized he was from God. Yet for Kierkegaard, even that was all right, because the closer he got, the more he realized that God forgave him. God forgave him for not having faith. God forgave him for reading and writing. So he kept writing because that was how he knew God's love in forgiving his sins. He counted himself a sacrifice for those who would come afterwards and learn to do otherwise. And in that, he was happy. So here then is a place where Kierkegaard is relevant, for, again, for contemporary discussions of the individual, the media, and anxiety. He enacts a predicament in which we are all involved. If we are here today, I would dare say, it's because we too love to read and to write. We too have tasted the ecstasy of the infinite, conceiving ideas, bringing them forth, watching them come into shape on a page. Here, Kierkegaard offers us a warning. Is it enough to land? 
Perhaps you say, it's okay, I don't need faith, I'm happy being a poet. But I don't think that's Kierkegaard's point. His point is that reading and writing and the attendant practices, we can talk about that, alone won't be enough to cultivate the inner resources that we need in order to resist the pull of virtual worlds. It won't be enough to ensure that the thoughts we think and the feelings we feel and the actions we take express love for the finite as well as for the infinite, love for the earth in us and around us. For that, something else is needed. There's more work to be done. There's work in educating our senses to the movements of our bodily selves. There's work in learning how to participate consciously in creating patterns of sensation and response that express and make real everything that we can think about love. There's the work of cultivating an internal compass, something that can guide us to choose love over reality. As to how one can acquire that sensory education, I don't think there is one answer. I don't think there's one technique. There are only stories. In my case, after eight years of teaching at Brown and then Harvard, I followed a dream that my partner and I had hatched years before and moved to a farm, 96 acres, four hours north of here. Rolling hills, open hay fields, forests, and streams. We have five children. We care for one baby bull, two oxen, two heifers, three milking cows, three cats, four hens, 16 chickens, and a horse named Marvin. <coughs> we grow food, we make food, we eat food. We ask ourselves daily, moment to moment, how do we live in love? How do we live in love for one another and for the earth in us and around us? How do we stay in touch with our freedom? Dancing, writing, singing, making music, farming. We try to engage in activities that cultivate an inwardness, a ground, a place from which to move, to resist, to critique, to create. We ask if there are better ways. We work step by step to create the world in which we want to live. It is not a path for everyone. Who knows what will come of it? It is one grand experiment. But I guess that is the question that I would like to leave us with today. What is it that we are creating? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, thank Mark Taylor for uh, inviting us to do this and giving us no time to prepare it at all. Because uh, it pretty much means I have to wing it. Uh, I've not had time to go back and read a whole bunch of uh, Kierkegaard. And I'm actually going to talk about uh, three atheists who are, you know, in some sense responding in the 20th century to Kierkegaard uh, and in, in sort of different ways. And I'm going to wing part of this and read part of this. Uh, and the, my, my three sort of characters for this story uh, readers of Hegel and Marx, but where Kierkegaard helps them do something. But I just pause over the fact that uh, Kierkegaard and Marx are almost exact contemporaries, and you get some very, very interesting understandings of a particular moment in history. One whom I think we can say was really at the center of Europe, and one is right at the periphery. So uh, the first person I want to talk about is Adorno. Theodore Adorno's first, first book, depending on which one you count, is his book on Kierkegaard. Uh, he had the astonishing bad luck for it to come out in 1933, uh, at a moment when, it's got to be said, Adorno does not quite know what's happened to Germany around him at that particular moment. But his book comes out uh, and is pretty much, you know, then uh, covered in a shroud of darkness, shall we say. Uh, and it's a strange book. It's a difficult book to read. Uh, and I'm going to land on the bit that uh, Walter Benjamin thought was the, the key bit of it. Um, and it's got to do with... Uh, Adorno thinking of Kierkegaard as a flaneur who promenades in his own room. You know, this sense of Kierkegaard in his interiors. It's freaking cold up there for one thing, right? So he's not Baudelaire, yeah? <laughs> he's, he's not public man. There are other stories of him going out in the streets, right? But he isn't really public man. He's promenading in his own room. Uh, fleeing precisely from reification, he withdraws into inwardness, uh, as Adorno would put it. Uh, and uh, what Adorno does, and it's a really astonishing little bit of reading, is to look at uh, the metaphoric uses that Kierkegaard extracts from the bourgeois interior and reads them literally. Uh, so it's to do with the, uh, the, the sort of the, the feature mirror in the bourgeois room, uh, or the lampshades and so on. And he's, he's 
you know, creating whole mythical landscapes out of, out of these like you know, bourgeois drawing rooms kind of thing. Uh, although he interestingly points out that uh, Kierkegaard is himself not bourgeois. He's a rentier, yeah? He's living off investments. So he is not a direct agent engaged in exchange and commodification. He, he is dependent on it, but on the outside as an observer. His crankiness about it perhaps, perhaps comes partly from that. Uh, and Adorno, out of his encounter with Kierkegaard, produces what he's going to call a sociology of inwardness. And so uh, Adorno is really quite cranky about Kierkegaard throughout this whole book. Not so much as, you know, he, he kind of hates Heidegger a lot more and occasionally recruits. And I'm not going to mention that name again, okay, even though he would be, he'd be part of the story if you were to do it right. But I don't talk about him, okay? I don't do him. That's my ethical choice. Uh, but he kind of, he recruits him into certain things. And, and what, I, what I want to say, if this is mostly a talk about people who do things with Kierkegaard that Kierkegaard would never have imagined or anticipated or, or even wanted, uh, there's a way in which Kierkegaard pushes Adorno into doing something that he would not necessarily have wanted to do either. And that is, in fact, a sociology of inwardness. And I think, for me, Adorno's great book is Minima Moralia, right? And it's reflections on damaged life. He's writing this during World War II. And he really has figured out what is going on around him. And he will do these, you know, sociologies of the bourgeois interior, but discover reification at work in it. As you'll unpack it and find things that Kierkegaard would never have seen there. Uh, but ironically, Kierkegaard is the key to enable him to start doing that. I would say that's, that's one thing I could get from it. Uh, and it is around about this time, of course, that Sartre is writing Being a Nothingness. Yeah, it's a book of the war period. A couple of very famous anecdotes that the book hinges on are to do with the occupation itself. Uh, I'm going to have to read this bit because I'm right. I, I can't wing the Sartre. Right? Uh, and it's a more affirmative reading of Kierkegaard. Uh, and for Sartre, the body is an obstacle to intersubjective unity. There can be no dialectical reconciliation of subject and object. This is a problematic thought for someone who's read Hegel. The subjective pole is considered negatively as lack and as nothingness, and this is his great contribution. It's not entirely original, but it's, it so works. It's, it's the magnificent thing this book does. Uh, but there is no meta-being meta which might include both the subject and that which it desires. There's no third term. There's no mediation. There's no God, right? For Sart. Make up your own mind about that. Uh, but nor is there a subjective group. Uh, individual consciousness regards others with an objectifying gaze. There can be no world community because there is no God. To be human, though, is to be future-oriented. There is no past unity. That other guy I'm not mentioning, right? No past unity. Uh, but there's no future reconciliation either in, in the start of this moment. We're condemned to freedom, you know, famously. Our free choice is concealed by bad faith. Uh, one should take responsibility for the choice of a project, but such projects never amount to much. That's what's kind of great about, about Sartre. Man has a useless passion, is the famous phrase. It's not from this book, but it, but it sums that, that version of it up. So after the war, this rather stark view of uh, self and world uh, had to confront the historical experience of the resistance, and Sartre sort of changes tack after this. Uh, his post-war work tries to respond to it, uh, 1945 lecture on existentialism and humanism, uh, your men are defined by their actions, and Sartre offers an anti-materialist view of, of, the, of revolt, the political act, as subjective transcendence of the material world, a sort of secularized leap of faith. Yeah? And it starts to get cathected onto the terrain of the political, which actually I think has been a dangerous thought in the early 21st century. I'm not going to go into that today because it's, I looked at those pages and I thought, that's oh, Sunday, I can't do that. But we can, we can go there if you want on the questions. Uh, so there's a kind of, you know, this is one of the gestures of secularizing what the leap might mean. Uh, then there's search for a method uh, where he's trying to pull apart Lukash, which he's seeing as this kind of dangerous, uh, you know, folding of uh, subject and object into each other uh, and where terror is necessarily the act by which that dialectic functions. So Sartre speaks up for the stubborn resistance of the particular to dialectical sublation. Uh, and for Sartre, a philosophy, uh, uh, well, you know, I won't do all that stuff. It's like he like, hilariously claims there are only three philosophies. You know, and the first is Descartes Locke, the second is Hegel Kierkegaard, and the third is Marx, and Sartre. You know, he doesn't saute voce. It's like, oh, and I'm the, you know, I'm the other half of that one. Uh, but interestingly, the second term in each of those pairs is not actually a philosopher. 
but is the kind of ideological, uh, you know, worm within it, you know, sort of the worm in the cheese, if you like, uh, inside of it. And he is, he is that to, to the Marxism of the PC, uh, the Communist Party at the time, in the way that Kierkegaard is to Hegel, you know, the, the, the unwinding from within. Um, but where it gets really, like, fascinating is the book that he wrote by taking huge amounts of speed, Critique of Dialectical Reason, uh, where uh, he puts far more stress on impediments to the conscious creation of the historical act. Uh, now, history has no subject. Other people get credit for this idea later. It's already there in this book, but which no one can make any sense of. It's so hard to read. So history is a, a totalization without a totalizer. There are only ephemeral totalizations of the fused group, and the fused group is very rare, and that rarity of that moment is really quite crucial. But the fused group uh, totalizes, the totalization collapses back into this magnificent turn, the practico inert, and then you're back into seriality, you know, like, like we're all lining up at the bus stop or whatever. Uh, you know, so we get our fused group and its project, uh, and we totalize into the breach, uh, but it necessarily collapses not only into the practico inert, it produces it. We produce that very thing that undoes our, our fusion and we're back into seriality. Uh, so there is in fact not a world that's knowable in its totality by any kind of collective praxis at all, right? And that was his Marxist book, right? And that's where we end up with, is uh, with this, I think, really quite astonishing and very contemporary term. Are we not always now up against the practico inert, yeah? Uh, and we have committed more resources on this planet than exist on it for future projects kind of already, yeah? Like we have built ourselves into the practico inert and we cannot get out of it. It's now on to the end. Uh, so, you know, and this, it kind of ends Sartre's philosophical career with this kind of great unwinding, uh, strangely by a Kierkegaard, of the possibility of a kind of dialectic of history. Uh, so there's, there's Adorno, there's Sartre, and these are two famous uh, readings uh, of uh, Kierkegaard in an astonishingly secular context. The third one I want to give you is much less known, and I chose him because he's Danish, yeah? And he's probably the only person who, who read Kierkegaard in Danish. Right, who's, who's part of this, this larger tradition of readers of, of Hegel and Marx. I'm talking about Asger Jorn. Like Asger Jorn is better known as uh, one of the great European painters of the 1950s. I'm hoping there's postcards of him downstairs in the gift shop. Is there isn't, I'm talking to somebody about that. <laughs> right? Because it's also his centenary next year, yeah? It's, uh, it's the Asger Jorn centenary. He's born in 1914. Uh, he was a member of the resistance during World War II. Uh, he goes to Paris to become a painter, uh, crashes and burns in the attempt, a, a precocious attempt to fuse uh, surrealism and expressionism. Uh, he ends up back in uh, a sanatorium uh, in Silkeborg in Denmark in 1951 with Christian Dautremont, who's a, a great poet of that era. Uh, they're recovering from tuberculosis, like that's how bad it got, trying to be artists in Paris. Uh, and they realize surrealism is dead, we've got to start all over again. And, and what does Asgion do in the sanitarium? He reads Kierkegaard. There's a priest there who happens to have the volumes, and he reads it. Now, the problem with Kierkegaard for uh, Asgion uh, is that he's a monist, a materialist, and a mystic, right? So how do you square that with Kierkegaard? It's kind of impossible. In fact, how do you even be all those three things at once? Well, Goethe did it, so it can be done, yeah? You can be a materialist and a mystic at the same time. The monist bit's a little hard to square, right? Uh, because you're gonna end up with, with uh, some sort of Spinozist, pantheistic kind of world. And that's, that's sort of where Jorn uh, ends up. And he recruits Kierkegaard in this quite astonishing idea that the function of the artist is to give form to the world, but that the artist's project is always a collaborative one. He gets this out of Kierkegaard. How crazy is this? Because it's so not. Yeah. This is the thing about being an artist rather than a philosopher is that you can read this damn stuff however you like yeah? and, and, and get something out of it in a way that takes it even further away from its, from its sources. So the role of the artist is form giver uh, to the world is to produce the kind of qualitative that will kind of mesh the everyday experience and the symbolic, but it's a collaborative and collective process. And the problem with modernism is that it's boxed the artist off into a place where the artist just, just does that. Yeah, we're not doing media, you might notice, but I'm, I'm just beeping at you. Uh, 
you know, modernism boxes the artist off into a place where the artist, you know, is creating languages that no longer have, you know, reference to the mythic, for example, uh, or creating forms but are no longer connected to the actual uh, process of creation and production. Uh, and so, for Yuan to sort of fuse those things back together is the project. And the organisation he co-founds is called the Situationist International, uh, and it's partly from Sartre that this idea of the situation is extracted, but it's partly, in Yuan's case, directly uh, from Kierkegaard. And it's the sense that let's take this category that particularly in, in Sartre had become kind of marginal. The situation is where being and nothingness confront each other, in a sense. You know, it's, it's, the, it's a domain, and it's kind of... Uh, only negatively described in a sense. You can't know the situation in advance. Uh, so what would it mean to create situations rather than to think of the consciousness that confronts, you know, ex externality, but to construct situations within which such acts would transpire? And that then becomes the whole project. Uh, and the key uh, concept for a practice, the Situations International, the last of the great European avant-garde, it's called Détournement, and one of its roots is French, uh, but its other, strangely enough, is from Kierkegaard, and it's from a little bit of philosophical fragments to do with, I'm just going to use language that I've found hither and yon, and I'm going to make of it what I want and what is appropriate in this context. And Kierkegaard almost gets to the point of saying, and that is how language works, and that is what the situations say, but that is how language works. Uh, there is no fidelity. And it's where this reading of, of Kierkegaard differs very, very strongly from the, the one you might find in Zizek or Badiou, where the key thing is the, the irrational fidelity. You can go another way, and it's to extract that sense of uh, the taking from hither and beyond of the fragments and putting them together, the making of them what you want under this name, under that guise. You know, and that is the other path, I think, by which we might get you know, we, we always have to take two steps back to take three steps forward. Uh, but one can root around certain things that have happened in contemporary philosophy back through that path. And strangely enough, one of those roots is through uh, Kierkegaard. But let's not forget Asgillon and celebrate his birthday, I hope in this room next year, <laughs> because he was both a great painter and a very, very original thinker. And it's not yet appreciated. Thank you. I am a storyteller in the most mundane surface level. So we're going to do a little change of pace because I will tell a story about someone in this room. We will mention Kierkegaard. We will have individual decision making in the face of fear and trembling. And we will talk about the media and the media heard too. But mostly it's a story. Uh, the first time you come into Mark Taylor's house, and you go into his living room, you realize the living room is a death room. On the walls, and this is going back now a quarter of a century, would be <coughs> rubbings from graves. It's since expanded, far more of a death room. But the first time I went in, uh, this was one living room. I didn't know yet about the ivy that came from Hegel's grave, but there was a rubbing off the tomb skin, uh, tombstone of Melville. Uh, I think there was one of uh, Hegel. I don't remember the originals. It certainly was Kierkegaard was there. And as we began talking, I said to him, you must incorporate this in a book. I don't think he really needed me, but I did maybe help push him in that direction. And the reason was uh, he often, like many philosophers, goes over the heads of normal human beings who walk on the street. And he had a very personal grounding for his interest in this subject, when you talked about it late at night over several glasses of wine. Turned out, as a child, he had had uh, two siblings, a brother and sister, who he really was not told about, who had died in infancy. Later in life, he had become obsessed when he found out about them with doing a memorial at the place where they had been buried. So his interest in the graves of the great thinkers had a radically personal tie to it, one that the man in the street, everybody could understand. So I said, 
you must do this. And that began a project. And I went with him. We went to uh, Woodlawn Cemetery and went back to Melville Grave, did a better rubbing. He hired a photographer who took pictures around the world of the graves of some of his idols uh, and also did a small act of grave rob robbing, taking little canisters of dirt from all these graves, the start of a project. I said, OK, the next step, though, in the tradition of what you're doing is going to be you're making a decision yourself about where you would like to be buried or disposed. Has to be uh, your decision. Now, we actually sat around one night in a little social gathering that included one couple that was then 70, which seemed like really old then, doesn't so much now. And they were 70. They had never dared discuss this topic with each other, never mind that the career of the man involved the study of religion his entire life. They could not talk about their own deaths and what would happen to them. Now, Mark and his wife got in an argument, too, over, uh, I want to be cremated. She said, no, you can't. And this is what happens. Now, part of Mark's work, by the way, eventually dealt with the question of what had, how had these great thinkers written about death? How had they wanted their own bodies to be disposed? How did those who came after them either follow their, their wishes or, of course, betray their wishes? Because our own legacies are not in our own hands. And in fact, Kierkegaard had been one of the great examples of this, as Mark eventually wrote. Uh, Kierkegaard had called death a good dancing partner uh, because it's an instant reminder that the differences that seem so great in life suddenly become trivial after death. And in fact, I'm going to quote, um, he had written he, that he went out to cemeteries. The small families have their own plot for themselves, approximately the same size. To be sure, in life it happens that, that a family is forced to stint, but in death all must do so. In life, an influential man can manage to spread himself around, but in death, all must restrict themselves. Yet there is a minor distinction, like a droll reminder of the distinction, which was so enormous in the world, but if there is a distinction here, it is a matter of inches. Now, Kierkegaard had written that. He was, of course, a critic of the conventional Lutheran church, when he died, his family had one of the potentates of that very church preside over the cemetery. Some of his follow followers squabbled with the family. His grave was not even marked. And then only many years later did they put a rather devout and un like saying on the tombstone, talking about him resting in the rosy halls <coughs> and ceaselessly with my Jesus speak. So this was an example, again, of someone's wishes not be met. So Mark and I went around to all sorts of plots where he might wind up. We went to little New England uh, family plots hidden in the woods. We famously went to a faculty cemetery where he had the right to a free plot. And he famously declared he did not want to be part of a faculty meeting into all eternity. <laughs> He finally picked, and if you know him, it's appropriate, uh, a point at the far edge of another cemetery. A very pretty spot, but he was at the edge near where no one else was. And he came out with this very excellent book, these photographs, an essay that tied his personal experience to the fate of many of his intellectual idols. And as we discussed, on the last page, as the last entry, he put a photograph of the spot where he himself hoped to be finally laid to rest with his family. Now, when I had urged him to do this, I also had said I'm kind of a practical guy. If you really want it to sell, you got to go all the way and sort of check out before the book comes out. And you know, you'll really be in there. It won't just be a spot. He refused to do that, but he also had seemed somewhat reluctant. He said, you don't understand what's going to happen. 
and I didn't. Uh, the motive had been, if you're writing about others, step into their place, make that decision, uh, you know, walk the walk. When the book came out, a couple of critics said, how dare he put himself in the same place as Hegel, Kierkegaard, Freud, and the like. They teed off on him, and Daniel Leapskin mentioned, you know, if any of you go through the public arena, this can happen, and either you fight back, mumble to yourself, or you just shrug and walk on down the line. So that's what happened. I mean, I thought it was a great irony. Here you come from one motive, which I thought was pretty pure, and I had pushed it on him. He took it, and that's what a couple of people say. So there's a quote from Kierkegaard that has guided me from the time I was about 19 years old or 20 years old and first read it as a religion student. And it's going to come back uh, to a point much like this. And I, I read it when I first saw uh, Either Or, which has been mentioned a couple of times. And it was in the aesthetic validity of marriage. And there's been some talk about Kierkegaard writing in different voices. If you know that book, some of it's written from the point of view of the young A, the aesthetic, who's infatuated with first love and you know uh, young pleasures. And then the counter voice is the classic voice of authority, in fact, a judge. The judge represents the ethical. And later on, there's a religious stage. But I loved the lecturing voice of this judge. I mean, I was a ne'er-do-well kid. I loved imagining myself being lectured this way. So here was a quote, and as I never expecting that this would guide my view of a lot of the public arena in America to this day. Kierkegaard wrote in the voice again of this judge, lecturing that kid, there is an unrest in you <laughs> over which your conscience nevertheless soars light and clear. Your whole soul is gathered at that point. Your mind draws up a hundred plans. Everything is planned for the assault. Should it fail in one direction, instantly your well-nigh diabolical dialectic is ready to explain away that as a necessary part of the new plan of operation. You hover constantly over yourself, and however decisive each step you take, you are ready with an interpretation which with one word can change everything. This was a talk about the sense of certainty and you, someone changing course. I think at 19, I liked the notion of a consciousness flo floating over a self and kind of ready for the attack it was really a rebuke to the wise guy in us. With time, I have seen the rest of it, though, as one of the most telling statements about a media society and a political society <coughs> in which so much seems a goof. You have a point of attack, proven wrong. With one word, you change course and instantly, with the same bravara, you launch a new assault. And I mean, I can give you practical examples. Over the years, I would write this up. In the early days, I'd leave it on someone's typewriter. If I thought they were doing this sort of dishonest about face, uh, that was when we had typewriters. Later, I would send anonymous emails. And uh, now I think of it often. Uh, you know, your mind talking about their uh, diabolical dialectic with one word they change. So how does it, how does it come up in, uh, in play? Well, think about any politics today. I'm not naive about it, but say you're a presidential candidate whose big achievement, and a real achievement, was adopting universal health care in your state based on something called an individual mandate. Uh, you run for the presidency your opponent adopts just such a policy, an individual mandate, with a change of a word that then becomes uh, socialism and the slippery slope toward loss of all our freedoms. Again, I'm not naive about politics, but uh, there is an example. 
uh, I would give another one. So often, again, I, I would think of the change of a word. Other times, I think of the hovering over yourself, where there's maybe not even a self there. And recently, uh, I was watching, as many of us did, the TV coverage from Boston after the uh, bombing at the marathon. And I have a lot of sympathy for people that go on TV and are supposed to fill time even though they don't know anything. <laughs> and there was an anchor man there on CNN. There were three of them. The anchor man who looked most like an anchor man. You know, you got to have the chair, the hair, and the chin, and the voice of God. And he started talking about you can rest assured that whoever did this was a sociopath. That's number one. How did he know? He knew nothing. Filling time. Also, he started saying, but it was <coughs> the whole body language and the tone, trying to be reassuring. If you remember the great film Network News, where the candidate reassures everyone we're going to be OK, he said, rest assured this had nothing to do with a religion, nothing to do with Islam or anyone's ethnicity before we knew anything. You're just talking, running your mouth. Uh, I would say another example, I'm just giving others, and I'm going to read the, the quote again, and I implore you to throw it at people. I mean, you can have the, again, the horde today is what's called CW, conventional wisdom. You know that phrase. You will have a horde. Uh, slam President Obama for his failure to court his Republican opponents. He doesn't take them to dinner. So what does he do? He hears it. And you see 10 columnists say the same thing. He invites them to dinner. No sooner has he done that than all is not forgiven, all is forgotten. Because much in the spirit of Kierkegaard's quote, uh, you're ready with, an, uh, with one change of a word to once again, you have drawn up a hundred plans and you go on to a new assault. And next thing you heard, you know, you're not a leader or whatever. Now this can apply both ways, but it's left behind. So I would give one more final example. Again, I operate in the uh, very tangible mundane world. I'm not going to speak like a philosopher. Uh, just this weekend, I noticed the New York Times had a piece looking back a decade ago at their great scandal where they had this reporter who fabricated. His name was Jason Blair. And I happened, it's an interesting personal experience. I attended the 9-11 uh, concert organized by Paul McCartney. And I remember reading the next day the New York Times and saying, how dumb could I be that I missed you two performing? I didn't see him. It was on a front page story in the New York Times. And I naturally nodded my head and believed it happened. It had not. It was a fabrication. Again, what do you believe? You know the old expression, uh, what I tell you or your lying eyes? I uh, didn't believe my lying eyes. The second point that was brought up in their own self-confessional today was how they had led the charge to warn about weapons of math destruction after 9-11. And what was interesting, New York Times is so powerful that they um, led the way and all newspapers that read the stories about aluminum tubes and that sort of thing felt like that must be the story. They're missing the story and everyone uh, jumped on board. There was one outfit led by a friend of mine McClatchy newspapers who said, no, we, we have seen none of this. We're talking to the people. They were viewed as crazy people. So those are some of the examples. As I say, think of Kierkegaard when you see people reversing course with the change of one word. And I'll just repeat the quote again. By the way, there's another uh, quote that comes when we talk about Mark's experience where he put himself in this spot of making a fear and trembling decision, and then had a couple of people say, well, this is an act of egotism, not understanding. Remember the one, people understand me so little, they do not even understand when I complain of being misunderstood. 
That's a real world example. But I'll read Kierkegaard once again. I invite you, like me, to leave this quote on people's typewriter or in their Twitter account. There is an unrest in you over which your conscience nevertheless soars light and clear. Your whole soul is gathered at that point. <laughs> your mind draws up a hundred plans, everything planned for the assault. But should it fail in one direction, instantly your well-nigh diabolical dialectic is ready to explain that away as a necessary part of the new plan of operation. You hover over yourself and however decisive each step you take, you are ready with an interpretation which with one word can change everything. So that's wisdom that I've carried with me for only 40 years now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. We have time for a few questions. We, we do, and I'm asking four questions. I'm soliciting them. It's interesting to think about, uh, the course air affair always looms large in, in my thinking about that, but uh, the, there's a sense in which that form of, uh, of journalism is kind of back with a vengeance, uh, which is, well, it, it was like a satirical uh, publication uh, and, you know, Kierkegaard had, had his engagements with, with public life, uh, but when he becomes the object of attack, it, like that's that's the kind of the, the moment where we start to perceive it differently, uh, but I think the the uh, the style of uh, small scale print is much more like what we have now than the industrial scale print of the steam press that intervenes in between. So there's a sense in which we're kind of back to that world of the uh, the small publications of which there's a kind of infinite number. Uh, and, and where that, that kind of um, roiling kind of mass uh, of, of, it's not even opinion, but of text and of media, uh, is the realm in which you, you have to, you cannot not be in, but then have to, in, in some sense, think your way out of. I would say, again, just in the wake of this quote I gave, part of the phenomena that irks me a lot, mostly it's good, is the media troll. You know what, uh, the, the internet troll. The troll is the voice that wants to turn everything into the most nasty, pleasant, adversarial uh, moment just for the sake of it. I mean, because, because I can. If you go on YouTube, uh, almost anything you look at will include a troll who's gone on to say, well, you know they're gay. It's almost like every, and every single one. So the voice that wants to descend every conversation into this, I'm just going to uh, take a dump right here, whether you like it or not, it drives out too much. So that strikes me as, as in the spirit of this quote that, that I've guided things. That said, by the way, I just would say I did a, a Reddit back and forth. You know, the Reddit community, which I had never done, where this huge community you can offer up answering questions, and I wound up going for four hours, and it was exhilarating. Uh, people throwing, I mean, there were, I think, 700 uh, comments back and forth, and you have to keep doing them. And you do have to handle some trolls. I just, my favorite was someone said, in the middle of a kind of serious discussion of gangster movies, which I would just put one out, uh, what's your favorite sexual position? Well, you have to be prepared to answer it. If you're ever asked that, the answer is, my position is, I'm for it. So anyway, that's, uh, anyway, I would go back to that quote.
It's a great question. Um, firstly, uh, I would want to say that I think social media gives us a pleasure, a real hit. You get a certain pleasure out of social media. It allows for a certain kind of immediacy that a face-to-face -face doesn't. And it distills a kind of pleasure that, can, that is sort of the result of movement, but you don't have to have some of the work involved in getting that done. And whenever you have a distilled pleasure like that, it can be addictive. And we know that from all kinds of substances in our world. And so part of, I think, what we need to do is to, be, is to try to develop a consciousness of the kinds of pleasures we're getting from it and whether or not they are actually giving us what we want. We can get pleasures that are vicarious, that are virtual, that are partial, and that addict us to keep wanting more. So I think in general, um, definitely, moving to the farm was definitely a move for us to sort of get out of the cultural context in which we were, to try to get a perspective on it. We thought about it in terms of an up-down way, really, in terms of that so much of our life is lived getting up into our minds. Just education from the time that you're five years old, when you have to try to learn to sit and to read and write, and try to learn to direct all of your energy into your mind so you can mobilize your limbs and your lobes to think. That's the model of how you think. You sit still. And if you can't sit still, you have a problem and you need to take drugs. Right? So part of what we wanted to do is to try to think, yes, it's OK to get into our minds. Love to get into our minds. It's good to get into our minds. But what are, what's the point of getting into our minds? That, I, the thoughts that we think need to serve the lives we're living, right? We, they need to be generated back. We need to plow our thinking back into the earth so that they actually grow good things, <laughs> nourishing things. So how do we do that? So part of what we wanted to try to do is think, what are the movements down that we need to make, down into the earth, down into the ground, so that the thoughts that we think are going to, in Nietzsche's words, remain faithful to the earth? I mean, I think Nietzsche really is a... Is a guide for me there. And for, in terms of my kids, I mean, it's really interesting. Okay, they are 17, 15, 11, 7, and 3. Or 3 and 5 sixths, to be precise. Which is very important, because that fourth birthday takes a long time to get there. Okay, so the 17-year-old and the 15-year-old and the 11-year-old the are off all social media. They don't have Facebook accounts. We don't have cell phones. We don't have personal electronic devices. They, do, they have email accounts at school because they need to do it, and they check it every once in a while when they have to. But they don't have an interest in it. And why they don't have an interest in it is complex, I think. I mean, Jeff and I are both network. We have our computers. We do our email. We have websites. You can go to our website. You can friend me on Facebook if you want to see pictures of the farm and our family, right? So, but we try to do it in a way that keeps the, the weight of our life in the actual present. What are we creating? What life are we living? How are our thoughts and our, feel, our thoughts enabling that life? Now, the seven-year-old, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that guy, but <laughs> he may end up, <laughs> he just loves his movies. So we'll see what happens with him. And the three-year-old is way too young. But, um, but the life on the farm has definitely given them something where they feel like, um, I mean, just to say, just to step one back, I mean, Jeff and my desire in moving to the farm weren't to be farmers. We weren't farmers. We were artists, writers, scholars. Um, we wanted to create our work in, in uh, closer relationship with the natural world so that we were subject to its cycles and its rhythms. But the kids decided they wanted to be farmers. So we take care of the kids, the kids take care of the farm animals. But that act of taking care of an animal actually is really transformative. I mean, I know it doesn't happen a lot, especially when you're talking about a thousand pound oxen and you are a you know, 60 pound <coughs> little girl and you are going out there and you are telling that oxen what to do. <laughs> It creates um, a possibility for different kinds of, of thinking and feeling and moving that I think are provided by uh, social media. I would just say there's no, there's no going back, though. And of course, the driving force is something we've discussed with Kierkegaard, choice. And just to give my personal confession, since I dabbled in someone else's private world, I mean, years ago, before there were even TV clickers, I used to lie down on the ground in front of an old-fashioned TV, and I'd put my foot around the changer and move the day when there were like four <laughs> channels and move it from one sports game from, to another with my foot. So now you just don't need the foot, and I, there's no going back. <laughs> there's no, there's no uh, going back from that. On the other hand, my wife's an elementary school principal, and we've discussed that the, their mission has to be to assume that the kids are inculcated in this fast, quick, 
pace uh, change in communication. So they must propagandize for the kids to at least get some exposure to long form reading and long form writing. You know, you can't reverse the other, but that's yeah, and what I wouldn't think we're 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 trying to reverse either. It's not like we're trying to go back to a time when there wasn't social media, or even go back to nature in a certain kind of way. But there is there is, I think, a, a sense. I, I don't think that there's this sense, but our world we're we're changing our world dramatically, and whether or not we like to think about it or we do think about it, there are very few people on the planet who are not dependent on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment business on farming. Farming is the basis of our economic system, and it still is. And so, and farming is a relationship to the earth. And so we have to be thinking about what relationship to the earth are we creating, and are we actually practicing our relationship to the earth in a way that's going to enable us to keep doing it. It's always the new media everyone complains about, as if the old ones weren't once new media that people complained about. <laughs> the, the novel destroyed all our minds, right? We read Flaubert. The novel is terrible. It's a bad thing. That's bad for you. When I, when I was a teenager, the transistor radio was going to destroy civilization. It obviously didn't. Uh, so I, so I'm, I'm somewhat sanguine about the whole argument, frankly. I just had a question for Kimmerer. Um, between this whole conversation about farming and also the entirety of your talk and of course the way you began it, I feel like you're giving this entire layer of embodiment to the way that we think about Kierkegaard and, and frankly I guess I've always thought about Kierkegaard as envisioning us as mostly spirit if we in yes. the best possible way. I, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that. Yes, I think Kierkegaard's writing is uh, to a large extent autobiographical and you have to think about it and read it that way. And I also think for him, he did conceive of himself as a spiritual person. He was aware of that. He knew that his deepest pleasure came from the reading and the writing, the writing in particular that he was doing. And, and I think that there are a lot of philosophers in the modern period who can be read as apologists for the life of the mind. Right? They create a world in which being a, reading, a reader and writer is the best thing. And it is the thing that's going to make you the most happy. Right? Or we'll leave this that. But um, so, uh, so I think that, and I, I also think, uh, you know, his walking has come up a little bit, but I do think that's one place where Kierkegaard, there was a, there was a crack. I mean, even the, the, you know, one of my favorite quotes from him is that it was, he's never lose your desire for walking. Like, it's one place where he seemed to allow himself a desire for the bodily, the finite, the, earth, the earthly. And it was, and he acknowledged that it was fundamental for his thinking. Well, one good friend of mine likes to yeah. say, never trust a man who doesn't mow his own lawn. There's a gentleman in the back who has a question. If we could get the microphone. Hi. Um, yeah, obviously, talking about movement being at the kind of foundation of faith and, and a lot of what you've been saying about raising animals and even walking is about kind of movement. Yeah. Um, and, and, and thinking back to the discussions earlier about choice, and it seems to me one of the things that characterizes a lot of economic understandings of, uh, of choice is a kind of fixity and a, almost a commodification of that. And so whether sort of thinking about movement at the, at the root of Kierkegaard's uh, <coughs> thought and, and kind of approach sort of changes the way that we should then think about what cho choosing is and kind of choice and the idea of choice is being fixed in that way, whether there's some contradiction or how that can be reconciled. Yeah, I think this was a, a point that I was trying to get to this morning as well, is that um, part of what's, uh, okay, there, there, oh, the idea that our choices make us is going one degree. And I think there's another degree you can go, which is the idea that every movement we make makes us. Right? Everything we do in our lives makes us who we are. With every movement, with every thought, with every feeling, we create something. That pattern of sensing and responding exists in us. It exists in us as a possibility for making another movement along that same trajectory or not, depending on what our experience of making the movement has been, right? Um, so if we want to think about that every movement we make makes us, then we have to think about from, you know, the youngest, from our youngest age up into our adulthood, we've been making movements that are shaping us and shaping our sense of what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what we want. And to, so to develop that consciousness, then, then we can look at it as sort of a cultural level. And we can see what are the practices that we as a culture 
get in and how do they shape our, both our perception of choice and our attachment to choice, our desire for choice, and the choices that are available to us. And part of what I see in our culture is that uh, if, you, if you just want to think about, I mean, reading and writing, okay, so the, so the virtual media, the screens that we're working with now, they're still extensions of reading and writing. Yes, now we have images, now we have moving pictures, but they, they become, they're extensions of the book that are sort of being reinvented and becoming more and more lifelike and more and more, in that sense, addicting, perhaps. <laughs> Um, and they train us to think, to, 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 they train us to a particular relationship to ourselves. So what is the relationship to ourselves that happens when we spend hours sitting on a screen? What is the relationship to yourself? What kind of awareness are you creating? And what is that awareness enabling you to think? Whatever you're going to think is going to be autobiographical. It's going to express the movements you've made and how they've made you. So I do think there's a real conversation that needs to happen. And I think it's happening across the board already in you know, neuroscience, in psychology, in the new materialisms, in philosophy, people are trying to say, to, to, get, to, this, to, to, get, to, 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 to get their hands on the way in which the bodily movements that we make are necessary for building brains, for creating the potential to love, for giving us um, uh, understanding, for giving us the actual parameters within which, and from which we can think. To, to say we are what we do is not to say we are what we choose. Uh, Kierkegaard is not available to be recruited to that project at all. Not. There's absolutely not. End of story. Thanks very much, you guys. Paul, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, no. I'm Terrific. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.